Amen. So I'm going to continue our, uh, our series on grace. And, you know, uh, people ask me, what's your favorite book in the Bible? And it's kind of an obvious answer. Of course it's Romans. Of course. Like, <laughs> is there any other better book in the Bible than the book of Romans? I mean, it just, it just, and, and for me, it's always a challenge to live up to the standard, you know? When I meet other people that carry this name Roman, I said, man, I, I feel for you, brother. I really do. And uh, uh, Ro the word uh, Roman actually means mighty warrior. And so uh, sometimes I don't feel that way, but <laughs> praise God. And, you know, I, um, I'm just uh, so full. I, I got back last night from uh, Lake Tahoe or, or flew in from Reno and... Uh, we had a leadership advance with another church, and I got to minister and pour into them. And, and it was just so amazing to see what God is doing and continuously doing all across this nation and even the world. And, you know, it, it just always gives me like a bigger picture of how great his love is and how faithful God is. And God is doing mighty things all over this nation and all over this world and even in this city. And he is faithful. Amen. And so I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to, they sent their greeting to you and they're actually packing up a couple of vans and coming down for our uh, annual Generation for Truth conference. So we'll be excited to meet them and to get to know them better. We're going to uh, go into grace and, and this next uh, part of our uh, message is a grace to overcome. And uh, it's going to have two parts to it. And we're going to kind of launch off today and, and, and finish at our next uh, service. But in Acts 4.33, it says, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. With great power they gave witness to the resurrection of Christ. And great grace was upon them all. You know, this was one of the, uh, it was the time of revival. This was the, the exact time where uh, the church was preaching the gospel in the face of death. This was the exact time where all the people sold their possessions and gave it to the apostles. And this was that time where they lived such a normal Christian life. Did you hear me? Because we... Uh, called the normal Christian life the radical Christian life. But I don't really agree with that. I think uh, the normal has uh, been so foreign to us that we call it radical now. But they live the normal uh, believer's life. In that, and the Bible says, and great grace was upon them all. And so we're going to talk about the grace to overcome. And we're going to build a stage for that before we go into that grace that sets us free from the grip of sin. That grace that allows us to triumph over uh, sin and over these challenges that we go through in life. And so I want you to go to the book of Romans. We're going to jump around this book from chapter 3 to chapter 8. And I want to challenge you to read the book of Romans from chapter 3 to chapter 8 in one sitting this week. If you could do that. I think it's going to bless you and give you a better, better picture because this really is a, a, a very deep and vast uh, subject. So Romans chapter 5, verse 15. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. So what it's saying is sin entered into man through Adam. In other words, we were born into sin. You know, my daughters, my oldest daughter is three years old. And just recently, I witnessed her intentionally, purposely lying. And, and I'm looking at her, and I know she's lying, and she's lying with a straight face like a professional. And I'm like, you are lying. 
And she's like, nope. And if you know my daughter, you know that, the face she makes when she does that, nope. And I'm looking at her, and I'm like, you know, and as a father, you almost like, you kind of feel embarrassed, especially if this happens in public, because you're like, uh, hey, I didn't, I didn't teach her that. Like, it, <laughs> and as a father, you naturally kind of blame her friends, you know. I'm like, it's probably that one friend she hangs out with or this other friend. But the reality is we are born with a sinful nature because of Adam, because of that sin. So, so she was born into it. She didn't have an opportunity to learn how to lie yet. She, didn't, she doesn't know or understand even what some of the things she does, but she does them naturally. Like I tell her, you know, for my daughter, it's like reverse psychology. So if I, I want her to do something, I have to tell her exactly the opposite of what I, what I want her to do, and she's going to do what, you know, what I want her to do. So it's like if I say, don't touch this cup, I'll just tell her, touch this cup, and she won't touch it. <laughs> if I want her to go to sleep, if I tell her go to sleep, she won't go to sleep. But if I say, hey, don't go to sleep, just stay up all night. She's like, nope, I'm going to my bed. So I kind of learned this early as a father. But the reality is it's that nature so we're born with this nature that through Adam, sin entered into man. But it's saying that God's forgiveness and God's grace, and the Bible outlines God's gift of forgiveness is greater. And it's saying the same way sin entered into humanity, in that same way forgiveness entered our life through that man, Jesus Christ. So that's what it's outlining here, that forgiveness is a gift and justification and your righteousness came through a man and his name is Jesus Christ. Okay? So we're going to continue. Verse 16. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one's, one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation say with me condemnation Adam's sin led to condemnation but God's free gift which means grace God's grace God's free gift leads to our being made right with God even though we are guilty of many sins Adam's sin, our sin, led us to condemnation. What I want to say, this is a big area that the enemy attacks our life in. Don't let condemnation separate you from God's grace. One of the greatest influences of condemnation is to separate you from the grace of God. In other words, to even believe in condemnation, you have to admit that you're justified by your works. Right? If you understand that you are not justified by your works, condemnation has no room. But to be condemned, to receive condemnation from the great accuser, Satan, is to say that I am in fact justified by what I do and how perfect I live. Don't let condemnation separate you from God's grace. In, in Romans it says, there is no condemnation for those who are perfect. Yeah? Or it doesn't, it doesn't say it like that. It says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Not for those who are perfect. And can I also ask you this? Now that you have received God's grace, are you perfect? In Christ, yes. But are you perfect? Do you still sometimes slip? Do you still sometimes get angry? Do you still sometimes practice unrighteousness? <laughs> the fact is, if you take away the grace of God, you are still a sinner. You still fall short of God's grace. 
I mean, of God's standard. The Bible says in Revelations, he says, I heard a loud voice saying, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. We have to understand now that we've, we will all face death regardless of how healthy you think you are and what kind of diet you're on. Eventually, you will come to that moment where you're going to face death and you will die, um, uh, you know, and leave this body. But there's also a second thing that all of us will face is the day of judgment. All of us, regardless of what kind of life you lived. So those two events, no one can pass in life. It doesn't matter what kind of vitamins you take. It doesn't matter how far science gets. You're still going to die in this body, and you're still going to face judgment. But what we need to understand now, that when we come into that place where we meet, have our second meeting in life, we will see Jesus with his pierced hands, the high priest. And we're going to come in. And he's going to say, that's, that's mine. I've paid for that right here. I've paid for that sin. I've justified him. He's, he's mine. He's in me. It's not because we lived perfectly that we will be justified. It's because we are in Christ that we're justified. I want to give you a few cross-references in Romans just to give you a bigger understanding of what we're talking about. And in Romans chapter 3, verse 22, it says, We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. It continues verse 23. For everyone has sinned. Who sinned? Everyone has sinned. We all, how many of us? All of us fall short of God's glorious standard. All of us. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that Jesus, uh, sorry, declares that we are righteous. So here we are guilty, and this is, you know, if you go back to Romans 15, it says that he made us right, that his gift brings us into right standing with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. So how is it that God's gift, God's grace brings us into right standing with God, even though we are guilty of many sins? Is God contradicting himself? Is he giving us like a cheat? cheat sheet or like a free pass no no what God did and this is where we're going to see this so he he declares us righteous he did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sin for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. So the way God justified us, the way he freed us, and it talks about the penalty of sin is by placing his son Jesus Christ in our place to suffer the penalty of sin. Why did Jesus have to die? Because the penalty for sin was death. So Jesus, in order to pay in full for your penalty, for the consequence of your sin, he had to die. But he didn't just die. He died in your place. 
So the way God justified you, the way God declared you righteous and gave you right standing with himself is by placing his son, Jesus Christ, to die and to be the sacrifice for sin. Death was the sacrifice for your sin. That's why the Bible says that the weight of the world, the sin of the world was placed upon him. He knew no sin, but what does it say? Became sin. He literally became sin. He became your sin for you. So that you, in result of that, can become the righteousness of God in him. So God steps in to do something you could never do. And justify you, not because you lived perfect enough. And that's what we read in 15. He says, even though we are guilty of many, many sins, we already have right standing with God. You know, if you look at the big picture, God created Adam. Adam sinned. The world got so corrupt that God flooded the earth. And saved Noah, Noah's ark, his family. Through his family, he got corrupt again. God found Abraham. And he says, okay, Abraham, one righteous man, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going I'm to I'm uh, have a relationship with you. And it lasted for three generations. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob's kids were already doing evil. And finally, God solved this issue once and for all by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place so that we can be free from the grip of sin and become the righteousness of God in him. The Bible says that the righteous will fall seven times and get back up. The fact that you have been forgiven doesn't mean that you're perfect. The fact that you're saved doesn't mean you are perfect. And you'll have moments maybe where you fall. But if you understand the grace of God, you will get back up. When you understand that God is not looking down at you and rejecting you because you failed. God doesn't love you based on your performance. God doesn't justify you based on your performance. When you understand his grace, when you understand his kindness, which means grace... It will lead you to what? Repentance. It will lead you to get back up. It will lead you to jump back, to bounce back. And some of you are stuck in condemnation. And you know, as I was ministering to these leaders, 45 leaders, so many of them were condemned. I want to serve God, but I keep failing. And I just feel like God is rejecting me and God doesn't love me. I said, that is from the pit of hell. That is Satan condemning you he's an accuser and for you to believe that you are rejecting the grace of God and a lot of people disagree with that because they think that you're justifying sin no you're not justifying sin but you're realizing that the only way you're justified is through his grace you know for you to even be able to sin you have to turn off your God consciousness and I want you to understand this. If you, and I know that all of you have been there where you've sinned. And, and sometimes even intentionally where you plan to sin. You had to turn off that God consciousness that you had to be able to sin. So what grace does is it keeps us in that consciousness of God. In that consciousness of his kindness, of his mercy, of his grace. And it keeps us in his presence. And so that in itself doesn't allow us to go into sin. When we understand, what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit bears witness to our spirit that we are sons, right? But secondly, that we are heirs of God. So when we understand that we are heirs of God by the grace of God, what can be more valuable in this life than being heirs of his kingdom? 
So in other words, when you see the revelation of that, all the things that tempted you, all the things that enticed you and drew you in become worthless. You're like, I don't want the millions. I don't want this life. I'm an heir of God. I'm an heir of his kingdom. And, you know, uh, I think I shared this before, but somebody asked Billy Graham if he would ever consider being a president. And he said, I would never accept such a, a lower position. Why would I consider to be a president of this nation when I work for the king of kings, who's the king over all the earth? In other words, the things that people fight for, the things that people sin for, the things that people compromise for, lose value. Grace sets you free from that. Grace sets you free from that grip. Grace sets you free from that control. You don't have to live by its dictates. You don't have to be dominated by that nature because Jesus came in your place, died in your place to break every chain, to break every grip of sin, and to set you free to live righteously. So when we're talking about grace, we're not justifying sin, but we're saying we could never live up to God's standard, but his grace came to set us free. So that we can live righteously. So he says. In Romans 4.4. 4, when people. Romans 4.4. 4, when people work. Their wages are not a gift. In other words. If you're hired. To work $10 an hour and you work for 10 hours and you get $100. Is that a gift? No, it's your wages. You deserved it. You earned it, right? It's, it's rightfully yours. It belongs to you. Well, God's grace doesn't work like that. You can never earn God's grace. You can never do enough to say, I deserve forgiveness. Do you realize that? You can never be in a place where you have the right to say, I deserve forgiveness. I deserve. You know, one, one, um, one of our relatives, he's not a believer. I was, I was talking to him. He was visiting from Ukraine, and, and we were trying to witness to him. And I said, you know, you know and we're like, what, what would you say, you know, if there is judgment and if you will have to stand before God, what would you say to him in that moment? And he says, well, I will tell him, give me what I deserve. He says, because I live a good life. I help people. I, you know, I, I try to do my best. So I think if God really loves me, he will give me what I rightfully deserve. And I said, brother, take your words back. <laughs> because what you deserve is hell. What you deserve is death because of your sin. But that's why Jesus came, is to set you free from that punishment. And you see, Jesus took our penalty. You know, Billy Graham was driving through a, a small little village, and he gets pulled over for speeding. And, you know, even pastors get pulled over for speeding. I just wanted to let you guys know. Um, and so he gets pulled over for speeding. And, uh, you know, the, the, he admits and says, I'm guilty. And the, the, the police officer says, well, you have to come to court. Um, and so he comes to court and the judge says, you know, you were speeding. What do you plead? He says, I plead guilty. I was speeding. And the judge says, either $10 for every mile you went over or 10 days in jail. At that time, $10 was a lot of money. And... As he was saying that, the judge recognized that this was the famous evangelist. And what he did was he pulled out $10 out of his pocket, the judge, and says, okay, you have to pay the penalty for your, uh, for your crime, and that's $10, but I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay it for you. And he placed $10 on his ticket and said, you're free to go. See, that's what Jesus did for us. He came in, and in that courtroom, you know, he, he said, are you guilty of this sin? And you said, yes, I am. And he says, okay, I'm going to come in your place, and I'm going to make that payment 
that penalty, that fine for you, and that fine was his own life, so that you can be free. That's what took place. So Romans 4.4, 4, when people work their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. And so this now is referring back to the psalmist David where he writes, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. What joy for those whose record was cleared from sin, whose sins were put out of sight. Why did we receive boldness to come into the presence of God and receive justification and receive forgiveness and receive righteousness? Because now we have a high priest who is right there next to God at the right hand of God who says, you are justified. You are forgiven. I have paid the debt for your sin and I have removed sin out of your sight and I have cleaned and swiped your record clean that's the grace of God you know when I was still a wicked man and did many many sins and this was before I encountered God this was before I lived for the Lord I had a lot of um, things I've done wrong and when I got saved I realized they're wrong and I and I had such a repentance, and I wept, and I, and I um, just had a genuine encounter with the Lord, and I began to live for God. But because of my past, excuse me, <clears throat> because of my past, I was supposed to be deported when I turned 18. And on top of that, I could never get a citizenship because I wasn't a citizen of this country when I had that life. And I remember one conference, we had a pastor who was speaking. And, and I knew the call of God to go to the nations. I knew that God is calling me. I felt the drawing of his spirit. I, 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 I was discovering my destiny in God. And, and, but in my reality, it just felt impossible. I could never travel. I could never even leave my state. And one pastor during a conference, pointed his finger at me like this. And he says, come here. And so I ran up and he says, God has given you your name back. And he said, you're going to go to the nations. God has given you your name back. God has given you your name back and he's wiping your record clean. And I was like, wow, you know, and, and I received it and I felt the Holy Spirit. I felt the anointing. And so I decided, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something about this. So I went to court, to Clark County here, the courthouse, because I was still on parole, and I was still on probation, and I was afraid to even go there because technically I'm supposed to be deported. So I'm like, how do I go to a place that is actually probably hunting me down right now? And I said, but I took God at his word. And I said, this is something supernatural. This man didn't know anything. And so when I went in and I, and I said, hey, I wanted to check how much more probation I have? Because I know I, I was on probation for three years. It's only been a year. And, and, and I said, and I wanted to see, you know, what I could do to possibly get a citizenship or whatnot and things like that. And she's checking me in the system, and she says, you are not on probation. And I said, no, 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 no. My officer's name is so-and-so. And, -so, and I, you know, it's only been a year. I'm supposed to be for two more years. And here I am in the parking lot in my truck just explain. I'm arguing with this lady in the courthouse. That's how far our faith goes, by the way, you know. And so I'm arguing with her that I'm, no, I'm still, I still deserve penalty, you know. So she's like, no, you know, there's nothing. And I'm like, no, there is, there is. I know there is. 
And she says, sir, you don't understand. Everything was cleared from our system last week. And you are no longer on probation. And you're no, you no longer have to visit. I don't understand how that happened. I've never met with my probation officer after that. He never told me about that. I don't even know if he's aware of what happened. But I thought the Holy Spirit sent a virus into the system, cleared my record, and I became a free man. And then I went and drove to the embassy. And when I came to get my citizenship, okay, my dad's like, don't do it. Don't do it. You're going to get deported. And I said, God, I said, Dad, God is sending me to the nations. I need to get my passport so I can travel. And so I'm driving with my wife, and she's holding my hand. You know, we're driving to Seattle, and she's like, you know, this is very serious. And I'm like, yes, I know. But I said, if God did that, then he's going to do this now. So I'm going to trust his faithfulness. See, our faith has sight. We can look back and see all the miracles that God has done already in our life and therefore trust his grace and faithfulness to do it again and again and again. And so when I went in there, you know, I sat with this lady who was supposed to take my citizenship test. And for those of you born in this country, you don't know what I'm talking about. But I'm, st I'm sitting in front of her and she looks at my file and she's staring at me and I'm like, oh, oh like something smells not so right right now. And she closes my folder and she says, how dare you? And I was like, ooh. Uh, and I said, what, what do you mean? And she says, how dare you come in here and try to get citizenship when you sold drugs to kids and you, you know, uh, were arrested for guns and all that stuff? What makes you think that you deserve citizenship in this country? And... When she said that, I looked at her and I said, you know, you are right. I don't deserve anything. I don't deserve anything that I have. But I want to tell you that I met Jesus Christ and he set me free. And I'm a new creation. And now I have a passion to travel the world and share the gospel with other people. And she's sitting there staring at me. And I gave my whole life story to her. It was like a preaching session. <laughs> and she looked at me and she was silent. And she said, she kind of swallowed it all. And, and she said... You know, even if I wanted to give you citizenship, I can't because you still have open cases against you. So she said, drive back down, go to your court, clear these cases, send us a letter, and we will have a board meeting to figure out what we're going to do with you. In other words, she's not even, she's like, I can't, even if I wanted to, I can't promise you anything. And so I'm driving back and I'm so happy. You know, I just know God's going to do it. I know God's going to do it. I know it's in his control. And so I went, closed the cases, sent her a letter, and we got a letter back saying, please come to the ceremony. We are proud to announce you a citizen of the United States of America. The interesting thing is I didn't even take the test. <laughs> so praise God. God knows how to make a way. Amen? Amen. And God knows how to wipe our record clean. I don't know how he does it. I don't know. But I know it's his grace. I know it's his grace. Grace is undeserved favor. Grace is mercy. We need mercy. We need the mercy of God. We don't need to say to God, give me what I deserve. We need to say, God, give me your mercy. I need your mercy. I need your grace. And that's what takes place. And so David says... What joy it is for those whose record has been wiped clean. So when you face the judge after death, you will know that by the grace of God, your record is wiped clean. You will know that you are forgiven. And that's the assurance you have even before you die where you have peace. And you know that you are going home. You're going to be in eternity with the Father. And, you know, we just prayed for our sister, our sister Joanne, who was actually a famous uh, pianist. Anybody remember her? She went to be with the Lord this Thursday. And she was 84 years old. And on Tuesday, I came to her house, and she was in so much pain, you know. And she, but she was such a strong woman. She never, ever complained. 
she got both legs cut and she was dialysis nonstop and operation after operation and after operation. And every time I would visit her in the hospital, I would ask her, how are you? And she says, I'm doing just fine. And you know, this lady really gave me such an example of what it means to walk in the grace of God. And she said, I'm doing just fine. I'm doing great. And when she took my hand, she gripped it really hard, and she looked, and she's like, oh, it's you. Well, kneel down so I can give you a kiss. And that was the last words she told me on Tuesday night. And, you know, I look back at her life, and I realize, you know, and I asked her, how are you feeling? And she says, oh, I feel good. And I said, it looks like you're going to be with the Lord soon. And she says, yes. And I'm like, do you have any fear? She's like, oh, no, I feel so good. And I looked at that person and I understood what joy it is for us to die in the Lord and not to have fear in that last moment of our life and to just to be in this place of rest. And so she went home just at peace and with such joy. And to me, that was such a testimony of the peace of God and the grace of God that we now have. <clears throat> Verse 17 in Romans 5. So we're, we're kind of going through Romans 5 and referencing different passages. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph. Say with me, triumph. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it. It will live in triumph over sin and death through Jesus Christ. Verse 18, yet, yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation to everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone because one person disobeyed God many became sinners but because one person obeyed God many will be made righteous we were born into sin because of one man's disobedience and now we are part of that many that will become and are righteous because of one man's obedience grace is Jesus grace is Jesus stepping into my place and taking my punishment and bringing me a gift of forgiveness righteousness and justification let's stand right now this morning I don't know your background. I don't know what you came here with this morning. But the Bible says, for all those who receive it, they will live in triumph over death and sin. You need to receive the grace of God this morning. You might be trying really hard to live perfectly before God. You might be trying to do everything you can for God to love you, for God to accept you. But what you really need is to surrender in the arms of His grace. What you really need this morning is to receive the grace of God. And right now as we worship, I, I want to welcome you. If that is you this morning, I want you to come forward. I want you to step out of your row and just come forward right now and say, God, I receive your grace. 
I come out of this condemnation and I enter your justification through your grace. God, I receive your grace. Come on. If, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, I want you to step out of your row and just make it down right now and receive his grace that forgives, his grace that sets you free, his grace that heals you, his grace that delivers you, his grace that says you are right, you are right with God and you have access to my presence because of what I've done. Come on, let's lift our hands and as we worship, I want you to respond to this call. I want you to respond and surrender to the grace of God this morning.
I want you to just declare this with me. The same way God declared you righteous. I want you to just say, Lord, I thank you for your grace. I receive your grace. And I thank you that now I am forgiven. I have right standing with God. I am justified. My sin, my record has been wiped clean. My wrongdoing has been taken out of your sight. And I am accepted. And I am loved. And I belong in your family because of Jesus Christ. And I renounce every lie of Satan, every accusing lie, every condemnation in the name of Jesus. I am free. I am forgiven. I am righteous in Jesus' name. Come on, give us a shout of praise.